Hi, I'm Mari. I normally make travel and adventure videos, but I spend a lot of time outside in the outdoors, so I've been interested in learning more about plants. Recently, I went on a foraging walk that was guided by Peter, and I asked him if I could film because I thought it might be interesting to share with you guys. He kindly said yes. So here are 10 tips that I learned from the foraging walk, as well as a bonus native plant here in New Zealand. These are just very basic tips, but I'm sharing them with you in an attempt to inspire you to learn a little bit more about the plants that you might pass by on the street every single day and to just explore more and learn more. It's pretty cool what you can find. I was amazed at all the stuff that was just right basically in my backyard in Christchurch here. Oh, and one thing to remember, please do not forage on conservation land or protected land or private land. Uh, just a good rule of thumb. So I hope you enjoy and I hope it brings you some inspiration. You generally want to forage somewhere away from heavy traffic just to avoid any sort of fumes or contamination or areas where you think that it might have been actively sprayed or people were walking lots of dogs and things like that. So a lot of foraging comes down to common sense. There's um, about 350 species of fern in New Zealand, but we can actually use the koru from eight species. The main one is the uh, pico pico fern and the hen and chicken fern. And so the koru from those tastes quite a lot like asparagus, and it's quite mm. a rich green colour. Um. When we're foraging, you want to engage all the senses, not just the visual side of what something looks like, but you also want to rub it and sort of see if you can release some flavour and see what the smell's like. If you're looking at going out foraging, just familiarise yourself with hemlock because it's a very common and very poisonous plant and it does actually look very similar to about eight different species that we forage. So hemlock is a really important forage species to learn to avoid. Because it has a delicate white flower, the hemlock flower looks really pretty and it looks like it's something you could forage but it isn't. If you get the green fern like leaf from the hemlock and grab it and just rub it in between your fingers and smell it, it's got a really acrid, toxic sort of smell, it sort of gives it away. But hemlock looks very similar to wild carrot, yarrow, um, wild chervil as well, they all look very similar to hemlock. So it's one of the potential sort of confusion species. So putting forage foods in rather than plastic bags. Food often will sweat in a plastic bag and it's good just to have reusable containers you know because we're sort of moving away from single-use bags. And I like to use the commercial grade one litre containers and you can stack them up. I'll carry some supermarket bags, put a couple of ice pads in amongst the click clack containers just to keep things nice and cool. That's this research that's come out about the eating a diversity of green plants. So foraging is ideal for that. It really improves your gut flora and um, is really good for health. With using forage greens, it's a question of balancing out the flavours. Plants with a diversity of colours offer a lot of health benefits, a lot of nutritional benefits. If you blend in a range of wild flowers into a salad, you're going to get a lot of nutritional benefit. Unless you really know what you're doing with the berries, from because the berries are edible on some of the nightshades and some of them are not. It's probably a group of um, plants to steer clear of when you're beginning out foraging. It takes quite an advanced sort of knowledge. Do is take a photograph off the mushroom, and you want to extract the stem from where it goes into the ground as well, so you get the full shape of the stem recorded. And then also take a photo of the dorsal view of the mushroom. And then if you're really keen, what you can do is collect the cap, put it on a piece of black paper overnight and it will release spores. And the colour of the spores sometimes can be very really useful in identification. I'd send the photos into a mushroom identification group. So it is good if you can find a plant and identify it to match the name Match a photograph of the plant with a photograph and the scientific name of the plant. You want to get the scientific name. 
the edges of rivers, of the beach, of farmland, of urban properties are often really the best areas for foraging, for the diversity of species sort of growing. It's a very healing medicinal plant. It's got a beautiful peppery flavour. Um, the leaves can be dehydrated and you can make a green powder from kawa kawa and then use it in a wide range of cooking. You can also marinate meats in kawa kawa leaves, fish. Um, incredibly versatile, um, very refreshing. It has got slight anaesthetic quality, so if you've got a toothache it's quite good just chewing a kawa kawa leaf. In Māori culture it's thought that the leaves of the holes that have been made by the kawa kawa caterpillar are the most potent as far as flavour goes and that makes sense because the plant's going to use its chemical defences on the leaves that are being attacked by the um, caterpillar. So yeah, it's one of the sort of top five native plants that I use and forage. Thanks so much for watching and thank you to Peter for letting me film and if you want to learn more about foraging check out Peter's Facebook page I've linked it below and happy travels, happy foraging, happy adventuring and subscribe for more videos from me.